I'm Robin Bennett. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the co-founders of the Dog Gurus and Susan's over there. She's the other co-founder of the Dog Gurus. And we have been doing these Facebook Lives, I don't know, for over a year now. Mm -hmm. And we were um, actually talking every month we talk about topics. So we always love to get your topics, your ideas, whatever you guys think we should be talking about, let us know. We're happy to entertain any and all suggestions. But Jennifer, who hopefully will be on here, she reached out to me and she said, hey, you guys need to do something on first aid. And I was like, wow, you know what? We really should do something on first aid. And we actually get all of our pet first aid stuff from Pet Tech and mostly from Beth Bowers because she has been a friend of ours and a member of our community for quite some time. She has dog training and dog walking in Texas. She does all kinds of things, um, including her training and dog walking and she does boarding and she does some the pet first aid stuff and she does a whole bunch of stuff yeah. all while raising some wonderful pit bulls and of course <laughs> a puppy little girl so <laughs> want to welcome beth and oh Thank look you. jennifer is coming on too so Je do you want to introduce jennifer while i bring her up too yeah i think jennifer is one of our more recent really? pet tech instructors and operations manager out at abc pet resort in outside of houston one of my favorite facilities to visit so yay we can see jennifer hopefully yes. can we hear you yes we can even hear jennifer so yeah all right technology our we're dog people we're not tech people i guess exactly. <laughs> all right awesome we got all four of us on here so both of you guys have different reasons for getting into this but i want to just kick it off and basically why first aid like we all know first aid's important but talk about some of the successes you've seen and i know beth i've seen some of your successes on your website of situations that have happened where someone was actually able to save a dog because they knew some mm -hmm. basic first aid so talk about why this is all important yeah, i've been teaching for pet tech now for 15 years and became a master instructor about seven years ago and wanted to i knew the moment i took a the first pet CPR class and the instructor training, I wanted to be a master because I wanted to help <clears throat> to empower other people to teach more people. Obviously I can teach a lot of people, but my reach would be much larger if I can create new instructors and the pet tech allowed that opportunity. Sorry for the dog sounds in the background, but anyway, so I, I wanted to empower new instructors and I've worked in the animal industry for over 20 years. Now I worked in a lot of boarding facilities, a lot of daycare facilities. I've worked with a lot of teams and I would see originally before I went into the daycare and boarding industry, I was a tech. And so I was a veterinary nurse for a long time. And over those years of doing emergency medicine and day practices, I would see all these clients come in and they would, especially in the emergency room, they would come in and they wouldn't know what to do. And they were helpless and all they would just hand us their dog and, or their cat and just, panic when I mean, they just didn't have the tools ahead of time of what they could have done on the way. Sometimes we were able to say that, sometimes we weren't. When I started in the, I moved over from being a veterinary nurse, I moved into the boarding and daycare industry, and I realized how many emergencies can happen, sometimes due to stress, sometimes due to lack of training with their staff, sometimes just due to the health. And it's not any circumstances that any of you guys have control over. It's just things that happen. And I would see some situations where people were able to save those pets, and obviously some that we weren't able to save pets, but, but giving people that peace of mind and that their team and themselves did everything that they could have possibly done. And they used all the resources that they had available to them at the time. It gave them a sense of closure, even if the circumstances weren't the end, the final circumstances weren't ideal. I and mean, we always want to save the pets, but sometimes we don't. But the fact that we knew what to do, we did everything we could have, People stayed current on their training. It gave you a little bit of, there's nothing else I could have done. And unfortunately in our industry, it's still not, obviously there's no requirement for it, but it's not even expected yet. We're still on the brink of that. It's getting much better, much, but much better. Um, since I first started, a first aid back then was not even a thing. And Pet Tech was the only one. And now there's a lot of different companies. Clearly, I don't think they're as comprehensive and complete as Pet Tech's program is, but there's options out there now because people are realizing how important 
this knowledge is. And I am, I'm supportive of anybody that's trying to spread the knowledge of what to do ahead of time, as long as it's obviously correct information. But, but that's really important for the, the long haul of getting more and more people in this industry to become aware of what kind of emergencies can happen and how to be best prepared for it. And I know Jennifer just recently became an instructor with me and it was a very powerful story, which I'll let her tell, but it, even when you're in the industry for a long time and you have experience and you maybe have even taken the program, sometimes we become complacent to that and we don't realize like how important staying current and pet people, our certificate is two years but, and I'm told Jennifer this in our class, I push our pet professionals to really do it every year because it has to stay front of mind. You have to stay current. It has, and if you're not using any of the information, which hopefully you're preventing emergencies, so you don't actually have to use the emergency information. And when you don't use it, it isn't as fresh when you need it. Yeah. Which makes sense. I, when I had my facility, I remember just getting a veterinarian, actually the tech. Mm -hmm came in and did like a little class with us. Yeah. And, and then I ended up doing another formal class, but you're right. There were not that many options out there at all, but okay. I do find it interesting still that it's not required. And, and the dog, it's we look at obviously the training that we offer and pet first aid is not one of those things, which is why we partner with pet tech and refer right. people to pet tech, but it is one of the basic training education that your staff should get right out of the gate. They, sh they should okay. not be working with those dogs without having some basic first aid knowledge. So again, for those that listen to a lot of our information and are members of the dog gurus, you guys are probably doing this, but this goes back to that. Uh, Beth just brought up that point of sometimes you're doing stuff and you don't realize it's not normal. It should be normal, but you want to make sure that you're letting your clients know that this education is available, that you're, you have made sure that your team knows this stuff. It's a great tool to make sure you're setting yourself apart from another facility that might not have that, but yeah, a lot it's, of it's marketing. It's normal. You don't think to add, yeah. but you definitely want to. Yeah. Especially if you, if you have an instructor on site to keep all of your staff current, there's a lot of facilities out there that have one person current. Right. They send their manager, they send their leads, right. they send the owner, but they don't, actually train the entire staff who's hands-on working with the animals every day yeah. a lot of times it's due to cost but to me the cost of potentially saving a pet's life or the cost of understanding that your staff is as prepared as they can possibly be whether they're with you in six months or not it's vital because that I, and i've had years ago i had a facility that did a training with me and it was a daycare facility it was a camp bow wow location and they we did a training it was our four hour or five hour program, which is just the chunk of CPR and first aid. And literally the next day, two dogs got caught up in the collars, right? They didn't play naked. They got caught up in the collars and one was asphyxiated. They jumped right into rescue breathing because it was the day before. It was the day before. Their training was perfectly timed. They were able to save the pet immediately, got him to the vet, got him checked out. And it was fantastic. It was just one of those heroic was, stories heroic that... Story that that's awesome. You That's don't awesome. know how it would have ended up had they not had the training. So Jennifer, talk yeah. about what your um, experience was and why yeah. you decided to get training. I know initially you were going to have um, Beth come in and train your team, but then Beth convinced you that do it a little bit different. And that's actually the way that we would recommend, but talk about why you yeah. ended up doing that in the first place. So continue ed is big for us. We're always at the major conferences. We try our best to be on all of your Zoom calls. That's just who we are. That's who our culture is. That's our ownership team. That's always been the philosophy. We have always done our best to stay current with the CPR and first aid, but we had the philosophy that we just really needed our shift leads. That if there was that emergent scenario where those skills were, would be needed, just whoever is that shift lead would be able to handle it. That was our philosophy. So at any given moment, we'd have seven or eight that were trained and current. And I want to really encourage people to get their entire staffs trained. So we have been in operation for 30 years and had followed that philosophy the entire time until something hit really close to home. So we talk about getting distracted and then not realizing how long it has been since we've gone through a course and how we have to keep these things at the forefront of our minds. COVID was distracting. 
we're still in this staffing bubble in our heads, like worried about just being staffed, but we need to worry about what we're training our staff. So in July 1st, I have a cow dog. He's this blue cow dog. My husband's a huge John Wayne fan, huge. So he has a, a left eye patch and his name is Grit. And in July, we um, found a little red puppy with the same eye patch and his name was Rooster. Just super perfect. We have an incredible puppy program here at ABC. So we start with socialization at nine weeks. A lot of places aren't set up where they can. That's a whole risk reward, a whole nother conversation when it comes to vaccines and all of that. But Rooster was a part of our puppy program. He was nine weeks old. He was with me. I am trained. I've gone through pet techs program. Actually, with best experience, it was the third time with Pet Tech. And I was on our facility patio. It was about lunchtime. He was having his lunch kibble. He heard a noise. He barked. And he inhaled his kibble. And he inhaled it just right that immediately he had a full obstruction. There was no choking. There was no gagging. It was just instant strider sounds. Okay. So in that moment, I had a very personal connection with this puppy and everything I had ever learned prior to that moment, even though I've been trained many times and I always go to conference and I'm always trying to listen and join in on these Zoom calls. In that moment, all I could think of was help. I screamed, I yelled, we have 27 people on staff and they all came running, those that were close. So the first people to me were not trained because we had the philosophy that only our, our senior staff, those that were running shifts needed. So unfortunately, by the time those that were trained and current got to me, what it was too late, he was gone. So it's not the fact that I lost a dog, my dog. It's that I had to look in my team members eyes, those people that I lead the charge. I go to the conference. I should know. I had to hand my limp puppy off to a team member and walk away. So I don't want any of you to ever feel that moment for yourself or for your team. Now, there are some things you look back and you're always going to go, I should have, I could have, I didn't, or all of those other things. But the key to me when I stood back was every single person that I grab has to be trained and current. So that was when I reached out to Beth and I was in a panic because I wasn't getting anybody re to respond. I have 27 people. I know I can make this financially worth Beth's time. Come tomorrow. But Beth really told me, she just, she said a few things to me that made me go, I, it's not just that I need the people around me to, this is going to change something, some trajectory in my life. So I can share this story with others. We are not, we don't just piecemeal this together with what we do. Our ownership team is very thoughtful and always has from day one. They've always, they, to me, they're industry leaders, they're trailblazers. They've known um, Susan and Robin forever since <laughs> yeah. they started, they were, right? They were my mentors in my, <laughs> when I ran my facility. Okay. Yeah. So absolutely. For us, continued education is every single day. And this can happen to us. It's going, to, it can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter if you're the general manager or you're, it's your second day and you're a TLC tech. You need to give them the tools so that they can respond. So you're not all just looking at each other like we were in that moment. I want to help every single one of these facilities not have to feel that. So if it's cost effective, you become an instructor so you can keep your whole team's current. If not, go to pettech.net and find some people in your area and invite them in. We're so stuck in this COVID bubble about worrying about financials and operations and some of these other things. We need to take a step back and look at pet safety again and bring that back up as a forefront. Because if those pets aren't cared for, they're not happy and they're not healthy, the rest of it's just not going to matter, no matter what, no matter if there's another round or variant or any of that, none of that's going to matter. So get your teams current. Don't feel what I felt. Don't yeah. feel what my team felt. Yeah, we're so sorry yeah. you had to go through that, Jennifer, and it's very brave of you to come and share mm -hmm. your story. So thank you for that. And just today I read an article that 
was something I hadn't thought about that right now there's like the, there's so many new pets with COVID and all that veterinarians are super busy and there's really a shortage and even yes. emergency clinics, there were like, they're very long wait times, like two hours, four hours, five hours going to an emergency clinic. So just think about if you have the knowledge, like you said, Beth, that you can be doing something on the way or as you wait, of course, they triage. So true emergencies yeah. go to the top. But if you've got a pet that's discomforted and still needs to be seen, your pet care first aid knowledge could be a real asset to that pet and to that family in the event well, there's a long wait. Yeah, there's there's a huge veterinarian shortage right now. And um, unfortunately, the veterinarians are burning out at rapid rates because they're so busy. They're so tired. And people, just the general culture right now of people is so short, right? So like people have, none of us, I'm sure, but, but people are grouchy these days and people are stressed on a level that that we've never seen before. And veterinarians are experiencing a lot of rude behavior from clients. My first shout out to everybody is please be patient. Please be kind. Veterinarians have one of the highest suicide rates. I've personally lost many veterinarian friends to suicide. It's one of the highest suicide rates industries out there because of compassion fatigue. And please understand that they're doing the best they can, but they are inundated with COVID pets right now. And, and they are just overwhelmed with people's stress coming at them because people take it out on people unnecessarily sometimes. So, so I will say that the other thing I want to make sure that I mention is so much of what we teach is what to do in those emergencies, but people join the class. And I, I tell my instructors this all the time, we market the CPR portion, but the likelihood of you actually having to do CPR is pretty low in the grand scheme of things. Now, pet professionals statistically, because we're around so many more pets uh, than pet parents, you're going to be more likely to have to do CPR, but there's a lot of pet professionals that have gone their entire career without ever having to do CPR or needing to know that skill. So much of what we teach is not the CPR portion. That's the meat. That's why we get people to join in because that's what they think they need. But when it actually comes down to it, the other skills that we teach are so much more powerful in preventing the emergencies from ever happening to begin with. I would, I mean, we have numbers somewhere of how many pets have been saved by people that have taken our classes. And it's astounding. I get emails all the time about, Beth, I've taken so much from your class. It's something as simple as like, I just learned to breathe. I learned, I knew, I knew what to do. So I was able to be more calm in an emergency, something like that to, I had to perform CPR and I've saved my pet. I get those emails and, and messages all the time. And as an instructor, that is incredibly fulfilling. I love hearing those stories, but there's no way for us to know how many emergencies we've actually prevented because of the knowledge that someone took away from our classes, because there's just no way to count that. But empowering your staff to be more aware of things that cause poison right? Or doing little things. I always ask my students to list five things at the, be at, like I have them number out a list. If they're pet professionals, I have them do five personal things that they're going to change at home at the end of this class. Like they're going to go home and register their microchip for their own personal pets. They know their dog has a microchip, but they haven't registered or they haven't updated the information in a while. That's a really common one that people forget. And that's, it's something so simple, but it's, even as a professional, we take that stuff for granted because we assume we would never lose our pets or whatever. And obviously I know lots of professionals that have lost their own personal pets because we're human, but there's lots of little things that they can do personally. And then there's a lot of things that you can do as a company. What can you do as a company? What can you change as a company to be better prepared? Do you have a pet for save kit? A lot of facilities have one, but have you made sure that it's not expired, like the Benadryl in it, is it expired? Do you have the doses actually written out by weight? Like I can do it in my head really fast, right? On what, if a dog got bit by a spider or stung by a bee, I can pull off that dose like a heartbeat. To a person that doesn't do that on a regular basis or to somebody who doesn't teach this class on a regular basis, I know that's gonna not come to them immediately. If you have vet tech experience, maybe. 
But one of the things I ask my facility owners to do is to take your pet first aid kit. If you don't have one, that's the first thing you need to be on your list. Um, put that kit together for all the sizes of animals of pets you care for. If you just do smalls, it'll be a smaller kit. But if you do all sizes of animals, you need to make sure that you have bandages for all those sizes. You need to make sure that you have thermometers that are labeled dog. I always like to make sure <laughs> that you label that appropriately. <laughs> my, house, my husband insists that as well. <laughs> yeah, like I, I have so many thermometers at home that I'm like, I just don't want to take the chance that I didn't label this dog. And I just, it becomes a dog thermometer. Unless it's coming right out of the package, I'm like, nope, that's a dog thermometer because I just... There's always that risk. Anyway, but writing out those medication or the dosages, we teach how to induce vomiting. Obviously, we make sure that everybody is cleared. You do not induce, do not vomiting, induce vomiting unless you're instructed to do so by a veterinarian or poison control. But we give you those dosages so that you have that ready and you're prepared for your size of pets if it's a personal kit. And for your facility, you list out all the different weights so that your staff can go, okay, ate something they shouldn't have eaten, poison control told me I need to induce vomiting. I would already have that prepared while I was on the phone with poison control in case they said, okay, go do it. It's already drawn up. It's already done. I have a fresh bottle of hydrogen peroxide ready. It's not like little things. If you've already opened the hydrogen peroxide bottle, it's only good for six months. Most people keep their hydrogen peroxide bottle because they don't use it very often. They keep it in the back of the pantry. You keep it forever. Yeah, absolutely. Like you think it's always going to be good, but it's not yeah. for vomiting. Vomiting is something that you've got to make sure you have a fresh bottle. So and they're a dollar. They're like a dollar at the drugstore. I just buy multiple bottles. And as soon as I use one, I will label the date. And once it's past six months, honestly, most of the time I just toss the bottle and I use it for cleaning or whatever. And then I recycle the bottle to be clear, but, um, but I get rid of it so that the next time I have to do anything, I have a fresh bottle ready. So it's these little tiny things like that can completely save your pet without you having to, without you realizing that you don't have to necessarily act in an emergency, but do you have all that stuff prepared? And it's Murphy's law. The more you're prepared you are, the less likely you're going to have to be to use it right. because you know of those risks and, and you are hyper aware of the things that you can do to change the, the likelihood of the pet getting into those. Well, and I think one of the best things you're talking about is the fact that when your team, and we see this with our training or any training that you do with your team as a group, you're empowering your whole team to think the think together and yes. to basically be working off of the same sheet of music, so to speak. Yeah. So, and then if just, I think of all the times that we get pet facility owners who complain, oh, I'm telling them to do this and they don't understand why, or I'm telling them to do that. And I think when you do training like this as a team and you've trained them the same way and all the team members are getting are hearing the same information and you're empowering them to make some of those decisions with you, I think it makes them easy. I think it makes it easier for them to buy in and easy for them to understand. And like you said, easier for them to come up with those, hey, here's some suggestions for how we can make our facility better. And Absolutely. wouldn't it be great for them for that to be coming from your team and not necessarily always coming from you and uh, trying to dictate to your team what happens. So I think that's important. So if you can talk, Beth, about, first of all, we had a real quick question. Sabine was asking, does Pet Deck do training in Canada? Uh, yes, we do have some Canadian structures. Obviously, it depends on where you are, but PetTech.net does have, we have several countries that we're in. And I think we're in eight countries right now. But yes, we have, we're international. And so we do have, in fact, Stephanie is an instructor and with, uh, Paw in order. Yeah. I don't know where in Canada they are versus where she is, but Stephanie Shipley is one of our instructors. And I, I think we have several instructors in Canada now. I've trained several of them. So I know, I don't know if they're actively teaching because of COVID right now and certain restrictions, depending on where you are, as far as like group gatherings and stuff, that's right. limiting some people. And a lot of facilities that would typically host classes aren't necessarily opening to groups. So that's put a little bit of a damper on it, but we're seeing a huge lift in that over this last couple of months. We were seeing a lot more instructors come out, obviously, to start teaching again, including myself. We're just keeping the classes smaller. We're trying to make sure that we do everything in our power to keep all of our students safe because it's so empowering going off of the topic of that. But I do want to say that like we, as pet tech, 
we are trying our best to make sure that everybody feels comfortable, but we want to do only in-person classes. We don't offer an online option because we believe so strongly in the hands-on and the muscle memory that comes from taking an in-person class. It's just not the same doing it online. It was, all of us are inundated with online classes right now. And honestly, I think it's refreshing to be able to do something in person as long as protocols are there to keep our students safe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, Beth, because we definitely promote and support pet tech for that reason. But the other reason I really like supporting pet tech is a lot of the things you were mentioned earlier. You understand the pet professional environment and that's different. Just your tips about doing the cards with the different weights. And I think I think you guys stand alone as far as understanding our world. And so to me, your training is really the best that you can find if you're in the pet professional world versus pet parent. And there's a big difference in what you learn. There's your helper. Okay, <laughs> there's, there's not a puppy's gotten big. <laughs> oh, that is, that is big five years old. All right. So I want to, I know you guys teach basic classes, but I want to focus a little bit on the instructor course, um, which is what Jennifer, I think just went through. So Jennifer, talk about how long is that course? What did you learn? And then one of the things I want to talk, go back, get back to is the price of that, which, but I don't want to start there because I'm going to tell you how you can make that money up, but <laughs> about, um, what you had to do to get that instructor training. Cause I know now you're going to be training your staff. Yeah, so there's some online or home study work that you need to do before you go spend. It's a total of three days with Beth or whichever master trainer you choose. Beth is amazing. Sleep for a day or two before you go see Beth. The <laughs> curriculum says they're eight hour days, but they are 12, 13, 14 hour days full of information and you don't want to miss a moment of it. So it took a good bit of investment prior to going to Beth so that I felt confident in you know, uh, who and why I was choosing to do this. Who am I? Um, why am I choosing pet tech? Wrap your head around those things before you go. They have great online videos to watch of Tom, the, the founder, um, that gives you an idea of the, the culture and the why. Of It's a three-day course. So the first day you go through pet tech's actual pet saver course that is also open to the public at the same time. So you're going through the program, you're about to learn how to teach. So you get to take notes and key things that you hear Beth say, or the master instructor say, you get to see the interaction that it creates with the students. It is so hands-on. There are funny moments and silly sayings that you're just never going to get out of your head. And that's on purpose. We're going to get sharks to say, doggy, doggy, are you okay? I think here at ABC, I think we're at that point. We're all saying it. Day two, um, and and day three, it's about digging into the skills and really mastering how to use the skills a little bit more in depth than you did in the pet saver, but also how you can identify and see it in other people, how you know, watch your students and how would you redirect them. I love how Beth does it. She showed some tips that I never would have thought of, especially in the world of COVID where your, your instinct is to walk up to them and move their hands. We can't do that now. So she has great tips. They go through marketing ideas to help spread the word and get clients. It Day three, it's such a blur. It just felt like all of it all at once. You, uh, you teach the skills and you teach some key po points to the others in the same class with you. So you practice it's recorded. So I've been, I've had the opportunity to get to speak at a few of the major conferences. It's awesome. It's so much fun, but you never get any feedback. You get like the forms and it's five straight down, or there's that one real grump that gave you a zero, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> She records it and you can watch it, but there's also a moment where everyone in the room can step back and tell you what they really got out. What were some key takeaways? What would maybe they phrase just a little bit different. It, it's so great to actually get feedback. I, I hadn't had it yet. So I've already been using some of those things. I used them at IBPSA. So yes, it made me a bit more confident in those um, scenarios. It, it's just, you have to be ready to really overfill your cup. Um, way overfill your cup. Lots of notes. I actually have three notepads that I brought home with me. I'm a sloppy note taker though. Um, 
So you might, you might fit it in one, but it took three for me and just tons of resources. So much resources. It, like this thick book, like of all of this stuff, you go over that over three days. You just, you have to do it. If you have a big team, if you're in pet care. And um, so once you took that course, then you, are you certified by pet tech to then teach to others? Yes. Is that how that works? Yes. I'm a licensee. Yes. There, there are a few fees, but yes. Once you complete that, you can go forward and teach. They do have some guidelines and recommend recommendations. I'm not going to go and put on a course with 24 people in it, starting with my staff in house that have to listen to me and they have to pretend <laughs> like they enjoy it. Um, <laughs> so we're so starting you, there. Have you done a session with your team yet? Jennifer? I have. We've done two sessions with our team. We've done two different groups of six. It oh, was that's awesome. excellent. Yes. Yeah. And um, I saw that on social media. So you were marketing yes. that you did it to your yes. clients. And yes. So the, how was I, it for the team? I mean, talk about um, the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's the program is so entertaining. And it's so hands on. Of course, they start the day with I have to spend eight hours with the boss, <laughs> yeah. see it in their face, what's getting ready to happen here. But it is, there's so many jokes and there's so many silly sayings and it gets them so involved. You're, there are so many points in the presentation where you ask them questions. If they speak it, that must be true. So the course is designed to make them say these key things, say the key things out loud. So they don't feel like I'm lecturing to them for eight hours. They feel like it's this big group discussion of six of their peers and they happen to get to cuddle with a stuffed animal while they're doing it um, <laughs> that they named. Best part. I made them name name them. Yeah. That is the best part. Uh -huh. So team building I think, so let's talk about price. Cause I know price always comes up. Oh, it's too expensive. So first of all, I'm just going to say that I don't think that you can put a price on how well you're, you train your team for first aid. That's just my personal opinion. But if you look at, this is really an investment in your team, just like mm -hmm. any training you do, like you're, there should be a whole series of stuff. You're training your, your staff. Obviously all of the onboarding stuff about your business and your company and the products and services you have, obviously canine body language, which we would always recommend for anybody working with animals and pet first aid, like bare minimum. But then there's also safety requirements and OSHA requirements, like all of those things, how to keep them safe in terms of mixing chemicals. Like all of that is just a part of doing business. And yes, you want to factor those costs in, but I also would look at a couple of ways you can train your staff. One is, and we alluded to this earlier, one is you could just hire a pet tech instructor to come and train your staff. The challenge with that is that every time you get new staff, you have to bring that instructor back in. Or you can go, a lot of the sem se seminars now will have, like pet tech might do something the day before or the day after. And so you could take your staff to that. But again, when you get new staff, you've got to bring that instructor back in which is why it makes sense to become an instructor yourself so that you can then teach your staff. You have somebody on your team that is readily available to teach your staff and can teach them more frequently. They can do lunch and learns throughout the year to keep things current, current mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense. But if you are still really worried about money, you can also train the public. If you have that training, you can offer classes to the public. You could just do free classes, but you could offer classes and charge <laughs> which now makes you uh, the duty expert in your area, which is- Well, yeah, so we were cool. like, I was ready to just throw money at Beth. We, at the time we had 25 literally. people. <laughs> yeah, literally. I would have made way more money on her teaching her staff. <laughs> way more money. Me. Yes, so I was ready, you do the math, it's 125 generally, at the average, depending on which way you go. 125 per person, I have 25 people. I'm like, Beth, Here's $3,000 for one day's worth of work. Why are you not like in the car right now? Because um, I was so impatient. I, I just was. couldn't take the time. She wanted me there like yesterday. And I was like, girl, I'm booked. Like I'm booked. And she's, you can't clear your schedule for $3,000. And I was like, I get it. I understand what you're saying, but no, I can't. Yeah. yeah. So the cost you have your tuition for pet tech, you're going to have hotel, you're going to have to go somewhere. Some instructor, some of you might live near a master instructor that might be yeah. local. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're in tech, you're in Dallas, right, Beth? 
I am. Yeah. So if you're in Dallas, but we have 13 master instructors. I think 11 are actively doing instructor trainings right now, but we have them all over the country. We have one in New York, one in Boston, one in Florida, one in Atlanta, me, obviously in Texas. We have one in, in Arizona and Phoenix. We have Tom and Cindy, of course, in Carlsbad, California. We have one in Colorado. We have one in Ohio. Like we literally have them across the country for everybody. So there's a lot of masters out there that are close enough to you. You just have to make it work in your schedule to become an instructor. Yeah. Yeah. That's what is the pricing. I don't remember. I just didn't remember going, that's so much so, less than the other route. So it's way less, where, do I, yeah. where do I enter the card now? So it's 1795 to become an instructor. And I will say, I when I talk to new instructors, that price sometimes is, oh, that's nothing compared to what it would cost to have somebody brought in to do an instructor training. And the national average for our classes for a full nine hour program or eight hour program of the lunch is 125, but every instructor as a licensee can set their own prices. So like my full on classes, because I have a veterinary technician background, because I have, I'm a master, my classes are like 175. So it would have been a lot of money for me to come down and, and do a class with her staff. Now there's a shorter version of the class, but I have minimum requirements as an instructor to make sure that my travel is worth it and that my profits there. Thank you, Robin and Susan. Uh, <laughs> so, like it. Very good. So anyway, but it's, there is some investment in the beginning, but most of our instructors, easily crazy easily make that back within three months of taking the instructor training now obviously that goes into what you make of it right so if you go out and you get your instructor training and then you go back and you let the world overwhelm you and you don't teach then no you're not gonna make it back if you do what jennifer's done she's absolutely made her money back just in her staff trainings right not and that's not even counting um, any client classes she can be doing or going to another facility. Now, some facilities are very like, they don't want to train other facilities staffs. Personally, there's a lot, there are so many facilities around Texas for me. I travel all over Texas to train, but there's so many facilities out there that I want everybody to be trained in pet CPR and first aid, whether they're my competition or not. That's just my not personal beliefs. People aren't coming. There's so many dogs, guys. Yeah. Let's all partner so together dogs. and do this together. There's enough dogs. You can drive four blocks in any which direction around us and there's a pet resort. But I yep. want them to do this. I want yep. all of us to do this well because we love the dogs. So let's right. share the wealth. Next week, I'm going to a facility in Houston. I'm going to help with their team. And it'll, that'll be super interesting. I'm excited for that. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Spread the wealth. Let's let's educate. Let's make this. I'm a trainer, obviously, and I, I'm a positive reinforcement trainer and a fear-free trainer. But there's a lot of trainers out there that are much more balanced or much more aversive than I am. And I personally had a little bit of a struggle with, because I just don't, that's not my method. And I struggled a little bit emotionally for a brief moment on whether I wanted to teach a class for other trainers that didn't have my style. But at the end of the day, they're still going to be training. And if a dog gets hurt on their watch, I don't want my emotions or my beliefs to potentially stand in the way of them knowing what to do. It, at the end of the day, I want dogs to be saved, right? No matter what the reason is that they went down. And I want things to be prevented. I want for people to not have to figure out why a pet went down and why they died on their watch. I don't want anybody to go through that. We've all lost pets. I, a lot of you on this, this feed know Potato. And for those that knew me, have known me for a really long time, some of you uh, even knew Bert. And Bert was my first CPR dog and he was amazing. And, and then I was very fortunate to have a second heart dog in my life and Potato. And I lost Potato this past June and very suddenly, and, and it was due to cancer again. We've all lost pets if you've been a pet parent for long enough. And we all know that pain. We all know that gut-wrenching, indescribable pain. I had one of my best friends just lost her cat recently to, we think it was a type of cancer, but it was growth on her liver. And, and she has seen me through all of my pet losses. And she's been with me. She's laid in my bed with me and held me while I cried. And she had not experienced it yet. She hadn't gone through that pet loss. And she just recently, a couple of weeks ago, had to go through it. And she's like, I don't know how you've done this so many times, Beth, because it's just so hard. And we all know that. I don't want to be 
my own personal beliefs about my style of training. I don't ever want to be in the way of how somebody saves or doesn't save a pet. I want everybody to be able to save their pets. I want everybody to have that chance and that opportunity to at least feel like they did something because I've seen students that come to my class and I, I told Jennifer this during the instructor training. It is very sad when you're marketing this class, guys, but a lot of your students will come to you after something has happened. Mm -hmm. And I use Jennifer as an example. She has done this class many times. She knew what to do. And unfortunately, the kick in the butt that she had to have to do it again right now. And she wasn't, I don't think you were overdue for it or you were just coming up on it, Jennifer. Um, it wasn't going to be expired until December of this year, December okay. 21. So no, we yeah, were current, so, we were considered current, or I yeah, was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That's still a but, long time. Yeah, but if you're not using any of this stuff, even if you've had the training several times, it doesn't come up right away sometimes. And you always want to stay fresh on it. You always want to have as many things in place and as many staff trained, because when you are personally involved in the emergency, like it's your own pet, you will question everything. But at the end of the day, with me being an instructor, I knew exactly what to do. And I still questioned everything I did when I lost Bert because he crashed on me in front of my eyes and, and I lost him in a heartbeat. And we think he had an arrhythmia or a clot. We don't really know what it was, but it was the result of a dog fight. And he was attacked. He was trying to break up a dog fight. He was one of those referee dogs. And, and he was amazing. And he got into a dog fight when I wasn't home. One of my fosters broke out of the kennel and two dogs started fighting. I have my suspicions, but I don't know because I wasn't home. He got into the fight, I'm guessing, and he was attacked and he was riddled with puncture wounds. He was just mincemeat. And he was still alive when I got home, but he fell into acute kidney failure. He had so many injuries. He wasn't even stable enough for uh, surgery, but he was getting better. And I went home and tried to be human for a second. I slept at the hospital, fortunately worked at a hospital. And so I was sleeping at the hospital that he was staying at. So I didn't have to transport him back and forth. And um, I went home for a few hours. And when I came back, he was barking really weirdly. And so I got him out of the kennel and he walked a few steps. And what I thought he was doing was going to pee. And he ended up crashing and he literally fell in my arms and I had to do CPR on my own CPR demo dog. And there wasn't a whole lot I remember after that, but I do remember I had two, it was 10 o'clock at night. And so I called my veterinarian and I had 1% on my battery and I called my veterinarian. I screamed, he crashed. She told me to call the nurses. I screamed, he crashed. And then my phone died and I had nothing. I had no communication with anybody else and it was me and my dog and my hands and my heart and that's all I had I didn't know where the crash kit it wasn't my hospital that I was in um I didn't know where the crash kit was I all I did was CPR and unfortunately I didn't get him back but we have so many stories we actually have a grooming facility there's this great video that pet tech shares where this dog was at a grooming facility he collapsed on the table one of the groomers was trained with a pet tech program, immediately took action, and they revived the dog. Yeah, and I it, have seen that video. That's an impressive video. I've seen It's that. amazing. It's absolutely amazing because it does happen. Like, there are a lot of circumstances. Like, statistically, and don't quote me on these statistics because this is from memory, but statistically, most veterinarians tell you that in hospital CPR, in hospital where they have a vet, they have drugs, they have straight oxygen, they have trach tubes, they have rebreather systems, like the full on, it's less than 8% that they're gonna survive with CPR, with a veterinarian, in a hospital with oxygen. So you can imagine in the field, how low that percentage is. So a lot of what we teach, and the most important part of this is one, so that you have closure, in that you did everything you could have done for those pets, but so much of what we teach is prevention, so much of it. And it's so important that your staff feels empowered and they understand the importance of this because if you have new staff, if you have staff that has never worked in this industry or barely had pets themselves, or they're just young and they just don't have the um, experience that a lot of owners or managers or supervisors or leads have, 
especially if you've never been in the veterinary field, you aren't gonna know that these things actually happen. Like sometimes I will train staff and they're like, I didn't even think that was possible. Like Jennifer's example about the food. Guys, I can't tell you how many times I've trained a, fa a facility for boarding. That is the number one emergency I hear. Choking on food. Because most boarding facilities with high standards don't give their dogs rawhides, but they do give them food. And they, the dogs are excited or the dogs are stressed and they inhale it or they bark at the same time that they're doing it because they're barking at a dog, moving past them or whatever. It's really common. And it's scary how common it is, but it is really common. And so you, your staff doesn't even know what they don't know. Right. And that's something we empower our instructors to understand is you guys don't understand what you don't know yet. You don't know what your staff doesn't know either until they've been exposed to all of these things. We go over bleeding and shock management. So if you have daycare um, facilities, the ears are hit all the time in a dog fight and a scuffle and bleeding happens and it's scary. There's a lot of people that just panic at the sight of blood and they don't know what to do. Most of the time, it's a basic minor pet first aid emergency and we show you how to bandage wounds. If, if a leg gets cut, if a paw gets cut, if, if there's a, a wound on the head or the torso, you can only do so much with direct pressure. But if it's on a paw, or a leg, any injury that's between the injury site and the heart, you can actually put a constricting hand over that for 30 to 60 seconds, and you can actually control most of the bleeding. Even if it's bleeding more than anyone would like, using that pressure point can actually control 90% of the minor um, bleeding injuries. But we go over choking, we go over poisoning, we go over snake bites and insect bites and stings and spider bites and heat and cold injuries. Obviously being in Texas, we talk a lot about heat, not so much about cold, but all y'all people up north, you guys have to know about all the cold injuries that are possible. There's always people traveling. So if you have a dog that is coming from the north here in Texas, that dog is really not going to be able to handle heat. They're not accustomed to it, right? Just like my dogs go into the cold, they don't know what snow is. We had snowmageddon happen um, here in February. My dogs were like, what is this white stuff for a whole week? It was crazy. They were like, I don't know what to do with this. Like it doesn't snow here at all. Yeah. So we go over so much stuff. We go over seizures, we go over senior care, dental care. Muzzling is a really important skill for safety for your staff because a lot of people don't think their dog would bite them. Yeah. And one of our sayings is whether your pet, when your pet is in pain or going to be moved into pain, they absolutely can and will bite. And it's really important because if your staff doesn't muzzle them and they're about to move them into pain and then your staff gets bit, you now have to prioritize the staff over the dog. And I know personally, that's going to make me mad. <laughs> I don't want to have to prioritize you because you didn't muzzle the dog. So it, it adds a whole level of complexity. So we show you how to do a very quick muzzle for emergencies. And then the most important skill, and this is the biggest takeaway skill for myself when I'm teaching my students is the snout to tail assessment. And it's when you go over the pet with intent and purpose, looking snout to tail over that entire pet not only as a CYA piece, right? A lot of people, a lot of facilities do have some sort of assessment, but do you do it with intent and purpose? And literally, I tell my students, paint your hands purple. That dog should be purple, completely purple. There should be no other color on that dog, meaning your hands have covered every square inch of that pet to make sure they don't see anything that's of cause of concern because if there is something, one, you need to point it out before the owners have been gone too long, especially if something didn't happen at your facility. But it also a lot of times points out things that the owners never even realized. They don't, they see their dog every day. They don't realize that things have changed. I can't tell you how many times I've caught cancerous bumps, especially I've seen a lot like near the rectum and near mats under the ears. That's a really common one. Hematomas. So the swelling of the pina of the ear um, where they shake their ears so hard it pops the blood vessel and the ear acts like kind of a soap. It looks kind of like a soap yeah. <laughs> except it's full of blood. So it's amazing what people don't catch and having my staff 
and my team understand what's really important to look for with these pets, not only if there's a problem, but just going in, it's that entrance and exit exam that a lot of people do, but do you record it? Does it have intent and purpose behind it? Are you looking, if what is normal for your pet, you will so quickly know what's abnormal. I knew Potato just by a blink of an eye if something was off with him because I knew him every square into that dog. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of that is knowing what's normal. And especially for those new pet facility employees who might not have been, might be around one or two dogs, but not the volume of dogs that we obviously see. Absolutely. That's going to make a difference. So, yeah, and we also have so many first-time pet owners right now from COVID, mm-hmm. so they don't even know sometimes what things are abnormal, and it's hard to get into the veterinarian, so you can help in that regard. But you guys are so passionate. I think we could go for another hour, but no, it's all <laughs> great information. We love your passion, mm-hmm. and I feel motivated, so I think you guys have really done a great job motivating everybody that listens to this to um, up their game on their first aid and CPR training for their team. and. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing your inspiring story. And Beth, just thank for you for having us. Being who Absolutely. you are. Thank you. Yeah. And I did put a link to Pet Tech in the comments. So definitely check that out to figure out how you can get someone on your team trained as an instructor and then start training your own staff, start training other facilities in your area. Cause I love that idea that it's all about the dogs and let's help as many dogs as possible and train the pet parents. Cause I'm telling you, they'll come and take a class from you. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So you definitely they will. There's so many other marketing opportunities. I'm just going to finish with this. Sorry. I wanted to say this earlier. Typically we think, okay, I can train other staffs or, but there's so many other people that you can train that you aren't even thinking about. There are way more people and way more groups and demographics that I could train. I don't have time to train them all. I just don't. So even if there's other instructors in your area, please don't feel like they're competition. Pet tech is a very family oriented. That's why we're so passionate about partnering with the dog gurus because we have the same ethical beliefs and morals about being the best for everybody and including everybody. And we're not competition. We're all in this together for the same purpose. And we're all here to support you. I, as a master instructor, will support any of our instructors if they have questions, if they have comments, if any of you guys have questions, I am here to help. A lot of our instructors will travel. So just because there's not one in your immediate area doesn't mean that we can't find someone who will travel to you for a staff training or help get you to a an instructor training. But there are first responders that need this training. There are trainers and pet sitters and dog walkers in your area. So don't just think boarding facilities and clients. Yes, those are absolutely necessary. They absolutely need this information. But there's a ton of pet professionals that don't have this training like groomers and dog walkers. there's so many dog walkers so many pet sitters since covid new pet sitters yeah. new dog walkers right. who quit their corporate jobs or got fired or got laid off and they're like i love pets i want to do this awesome let's support them and make sure that they have the skills and that they can save these pets and and there's just so many of these first responders there's uh, sports like dog sports teams agility teams the list goes on and on and i can talk through that for days on end about how many opportunities you have as an instructor so it's not just your team and we have a lot of instructors that literally just get certified to teach the team and that's fine we have very low minimum requirements so that we can give people that opportunity to just keep their team trained. But we also encourage you to find all of the opportunities, things that your niche, what are you passionate about? We promote training with kids. I have a lot of kids that have done trainings with me and we'll do many sessions, but we set you up with the marketing tools for that. If you have a passion for kids or senior citizens that have, I do, I've done trainings at nursing homes because a lot of those senior citizens have older and they, the staff at the nursing home need to know how to save those pets. People that have dog-friendly restaurants, dog-friendly hotels, the staff there want to know what to do. So there's crazy amounts of people that are out there that are marketing opportunities for you. So don't just stick to the, I got clients, which is an automatic, if you have a facility, you already have an audience that's waiting for you to do a training. But there's a lot of revenue that's sitting on the table. And can I say one more thing, Robin? Sure. I wanna say one more thing about, if you're an owner, of a facility, I do want to make sure that you understand that while you may not want to become an instructor, I understand that there's a lot of owners that are like, I have enough on my plate. The last thing I need to be doing is adding this one project 
trust me, Susan and Robin know I'm a project kind of girl. I like new things. I like new things to do. I do understand that there's a lot of owners that just can't even imagine doing this. I want to be very clear that pet tech certifies an individual. So if you're thinking about sending your manager or your supervisor or your lead to do this, one, get a contract, make sure that it is very clear what the agreement is for them to teach and to pay you back if you're investing in it. But I also want to make sure that you understand that when they leave, if they leave, they may be with you forever, but if they leave, that certification goes with them because we do have some, we do have some facilities who have not taken the precautions that we have advised and their instructors have left for a reason or another, and then they're out the money and they're out that instructor. So please one, get yourself trained is what my personal advice would be. Or if you have somebody amazing like Jennifer, who's proved her dedication, but have an agreement in place. Even if you think they're never going to leave, please take the steps to protect your business investment. It's worth it. It's worth it in spades, but we have seen some instructors that that do leave for various reasons and we don't want to we want to make sure that you as a business owner still have the opportunity to um, make back your investment or get paid back if an instructor leaves so i just wanted to say that earlier when we were talking about owners because a lot of owners don't want to take this on they don't want to be or they don't like public speaking they don't want to do this they just don't think that they're qualified and i'll last thing i'll say is this just because you haven't been in this industry very long guys does not mean that you can't be an instructor Just because you've never spoken at a conference does not mean that you can't become an instructor. We give you all the tools. We help you market. We help teach you how to speak. We teach you how to be the most effective instructor that you can be. And we give you all the materials so that, and we have tons of support for you, marketing support, teaching support. Your master instructor is there for your support. We're there to help you, whether you have experience in this industry or you're new. Anybody can be an instructor and we're there to support you in making sure that you can do that and give us, give more people an opportunity to learn. And we're always looking for new instructors and growing and getting that hands-on muscle memory into people's, into people's bodies. So they know what to do. And it just comes back. It's amazing. It's amazing how it comes back so fast when you need it. Awesome. We do appreciate both of you guys being here. We think this is a super important topic and i think every facility hopefully you guys will get in touch with pet tech and get an instructor on your staff as soon as possible 